to Sam, Missouri way. They brag about the Santa Fe, the New York Central B and O. Those are the toast of Ohio. Kentucky's got the L and M, and Pennsylvania's got the Pimp. In Michigan, it's the Pier Market. But there's a grander railroad yet. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine. Cause that fruit and soup, all the cheese, a whole year line. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine. Cause that fruit and soup, all the cheese, a whole year line. All aboard, all aboard. It's my Indiana home that I'm ahead and toward. Oh, up and down the Monon. Everything is fine, cause that fruit and toot, bone on cheese, oh, hold your line. The Monon was not large as railroads go. Although it was a class one line, it owned no trackage outside Indiana. A north-south railroad, it never really was strong, but in the nearly century and a quarter, it ran as an independent, it engendered the affection and admiration of generations of employees and observers. Here are the highlights of that story. In its final years, the railroad's corporate title was simply Monon. In prior years, Monon was a nickname for the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railroad. The railroad defined the letter X on the Indiana map, the crossing of the X taking place at the little town of Monon. It was an Indian word for swift running water, and the railroad translated it simply as swift running. In order to reach the passenger stations in the three largest cities it served, the Monon had to use trackage rights on other lines. Into Chicago, it ran on the Chicago and Western Indiana from the state line to Dearborn Station in downtown Chicago. Indianapolis, once the hub of a vast electric interurban network, was the Monon's southern terminal for one side of the X, the railroad described on the Hoosier map. The Chicago passenger trains reached downtown Indianapolis on the tracks of the Indianapolis Union Railway, where passengers used the Indianapolis Union Station. However, there was a time when Monon coaches reached Cincinnati by way of the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railway. And years after there were no more Monon passenger trains, those who refurbished the old Union Station included cars from the steam era and a display which honored the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railroad, the Monon route, with its famous train, the Hoosier. Now, the Monon crossed the Ohio River on the rails of the Kentucky and Indiana Terminal Railroad to and from New Albany. Here is the Louisville Union Station in the early 1960s when the LNN was running the Civil War Locomotive General to observe the 100th anniversary of the war between the states. But this is how early locomotives looked. The first predecessor line of the CINL was the New Albany and Salem Railroad of 1847. By 1851, the promoters of the line proposed to build all the way to Michigan City, thereby linking the Ohio River with the Great Lakes. But the new railroad didn't have the money for such an undertaking. At that time, the Michigan Central, which was locked in a race with the Michigan Southern and Northern Indiana to get to Chicago, was unable to get a charter from the Indiana legislature. 
the New Albany and Salem, in a deal with the Michigan Central, used its roving charter to acquire the land the Michigan Central needed. Then, it used the Michigan Central cash to finish its own line into Michigan City. In one of the films produced by the Monon as a public relations measure, it dramatized a meeting of founder James Brooks and the early directors of the New Albany and Salem. Doubting the success of the project, gentlemen. Railroads are being built in the east, and not by dreamers either. They're being built by sound businessmen because they have seen that the iron rail and the steam locomotive are the real answers to long-distance hauling. I'd rather stick to canal. We know what they'll do. Oh, you can't build a canal over the knob. There's too much rough country between here and the White River. The state's already poured a lot of money into the Macadam Road. Let's finish them. Wagons, even on the best of roads. We'll never haul a pittance of the stuff we could haul on rail. I say, let's take over some of this right of way that's been graded, as the new law has made it possible to, and let's put rails on the right of way. Railroads, gentlemen, are the answer. Men like James Brooks carried their point. Railroads were built, and the people took to them. They shipped their goods over them. They wanted to ride the trains whenever they could. Fun to go riding and riding and riding along on the passenger car. It's exciting, 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 like moving along on the dark. Oh, it's fun to go riding and riding and riding. No journey would ever be long. When the wheel clicks in rhythm, my heart is in rhythm. The Michigan Central, as it turned out, got the best of the deal, as these later films would indicate. And while the Monon's predecessor was able to reach Chicago by way of Michigan City and the Michigan Central, Michigan City never became a major interchange for the Hoosier Line. Indeed, Michigan City never became the great lake port that Chicago became. By late 1859, the name New Albany and Salem was inadequate, and the legislature authorized the railroad to be called the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago. During the Civil War, the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago carried food and war material southward for the Union Army. And once in 1863 was vandalized by Morgan's raiders, who burned the depot and bridge at Salem and stopped service for nearly a week. The one event of note in those years was the handling of the Lincoln funeral train to Michigan City, where it was stopped for servicing and where the residents had constructed a floral arch under which the train passed. The train was retracing basically the route the martyred president had taken when he had left his home at Springfield, Illinois, and gone to assume the presidency at Washington. Well, the funeral train came out of Indianapolis to Lafayette, and then northward on the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago to Michigan City, where the Michigan Central then took it into Chicago. Among the early locomotives of the New Albany and Salem, which were transferred to the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago, was number 11, a Norris-built machine believed to have been constructed in 1853. In 1870, the 440 named Admiral was photographed at Lafayette, a picture which was used in later years by the Monon for publicity purposes, including its display on such artifacts as ashtrays, rulers, and keychains. Also among the prized antique photos of the early Monon, this Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago milk train at the Lowell Station, some 45 miles south of Chicago, in 1886. The decade of the 1880s was one of expansion for the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago, through merger and construction, it obtained its line between Indianapolis and Chicago, crossing the Louisville-Michigan City main line at the little town of New Bradford, which had been renamed Monon for the stream which flowed through it. From 1899 to 1909, W.H. McDowell was president of the line, one of the three most important men in the railroad's history. He made major improvements mainly on the south end, and the McDowell Yard at Bloomington was named for his accomplishments. Among the improvements in the McDowell era was the Indiana Limestone Station at Lafayette. 
Here, over the decades, thousands of Purdue students arrived and departed Lafayette during their school terms. Indeed, the Monon carries students from several Hoosier schools. The Monon is known as the College Line and serves some of the best-known institutions of higher learning in America. Indiana University, Purdue, DePaul, Wabash, Butler, and West Baden. Lafayette eventually became the center of Monon's activities, mainly because the shops were built there. Not far from the intersection of the two main lines at Monon, the citizens of Fairfield Township, Tippecanoe County, pledged $100,000 and 45 acres to the railroad to induce it to build its shops complex there on the north edge of Lafayette. It was another of the improvements of the McDowell era. Before the turn of the 20th century, the Monon carried out a joint service with the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton, which provided through trains between Chicago and Cincinnati by way of Indianapolis. Here are some of the cars built especially for the service. Posed brand new at the Pullman shops at South Chicago in 1889, through World War I it was a favorable arrangement for both railroads. The cars carrying the CH and D letters plus the Monon lozenge. For most of his life, the Monon steam power was what you'd find on other American railroads. The design engineers had thought about an articulated four-cylinder engine, and for a time, they proposed a 4104 locomotive, which surely would have become a class to be called the Monon type. But it didn't happen, and the final order for steam locomotives was for heavy Mikados. of the Monon Pacific class at the head of passenger trains, but here again it was what could be seen on other lines of the period. For instance, there was the 451 photographed at the 63rd Street Englewood Station in Chicago at the head of the Hoosier. The tower of the Southtown Theater can be seen just over the locomotive's tender. The Monon shared terminal space with other railroads at Louisville, Indianapolis, and Chicago. At Louisville, the station had to contend with floods on the Ohio River, and while this locomotive is not a Monon engine, any could have been caught in the flooding. At Chicago, trains left the Dearborn Station for east, south, and west destinations. As this grand old terminal was shared by the Erie, the Santa Fe, Grand Trunk, Wabash, Chicago, and eastern Illinois, the Chicago and western Indiana's commuter trains, and the Monon. Now here at Dearborn Station, the world's best-known gangster, Al Capone, began his trip to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. He's the man in the white hat. This is 1932, and Capone is the guest of the government on the CNEI's Dixie Flyer out of Dearborn. Like other railroads, the Monon had its derailments and wrecks, but it had no catastrophic accidents with heavy loss of life as some of its peers. One wreck in 1892 killed the engineer and fireman in engine number 27 when the washout weakened the wooden bridge at Otis. Then on April 9th of 1924, a freight train derailment at the Wabash River caused that bridge to collapse. The Monon was not unusual in that it, like other lines, carried a good deal of coal. Much of it was mined in Indiana at online points, and a lot of it was handled northward to the Chicago and Gary areas from the Kentucky mine fields. So it was that the Monon interchanged coal from the Southern and the Louisville and Nashville. Indeed, both of those roads at one time owned Monon stock. Other freight was the heavy Indiana limestone from the Bloomington and Bedford quarries. Unfortunately, that was a low tariff commodity and amounted to more tonnage than revenue. There were the agricultural products, including the largest, corn, but as the major source of freight, agriculture did not provide a large percentage of the revenue. The line which eventually became the Monon did connect the Ohio River with the Great Lakes. But despite what its founders believed, that was not the major source of traffic for the railroad. Its bridge traffic from the east-west lines it crossed did become significant, amounting to two-thirds of its business on line originations developing one-third. After struggling through the prosperous years just before the Great Depression, the Monon went into bankruptcy in 1933, a situation which lasted through World War II. Finally, in 1946, the federal court in Chicago approved a reorganization plan which set up a new corporation, the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville. 
The new board of directors installed as president a career railroad man, John W. Berriger III. And the Monon entered its highly colorful and enthusiastic years, which historians call the Berriger era. Well, thus, John Berriger became the third most conspicuous head of the railroad. And he announced that the Monon would be a guinea pig as a model of a super railroad. It was the beginning of the major effort by the railroads of the nation to change from steam power to diesel power, and the Monon became one of the first Class I roads to change completely. 54 units did the job of changeover between 1946 and 1948. In fact, the diesels arrived on the line before the railroad had managed to re-equip its passenger trains, and the diesels were seen pulling the old standard heavyweight passenger coaches. It was the Monon's project to bring new passenger cars to its line, which brought about a most ingenious and rewarding scenario. Just after World War II, the plants turning out new passenger equipment for the American railroads had big backlogs of orders. It would have been two or three years before the Monon could have hoped to purchase new cars. Then, the genius of an idea began to be seen. The Army had numerous hospital cars which were surplus. Now that the war was over, the cars had seen little, if any, use and were built for easy riding. Berger's Monon purchased 28 of the cars and they were shipped to the Lafayette shops. Attempting to beat the self-imposed deadline for celebrating the Monon's 100th anniversary, which was to occur in 1947, the engineers and craftsmen at the shops worked diligently to rebuild the hospital cars into passenger equipment. To thank the employees for their extra effort, the railroad had a film made of the rebuilding process. And we excerpt portions here. Immediately, the work of conversion was begun. And from these hospital cars grew combination baggage mail cars, dining bar lounge cars, and parlor cars. The many scenes of actual construction show how the task was assumed and the progress made. <laughs> blasted off to expose the clean surface of raw steel. Wheels were taken off, reconditioned and true. Trucks were completely overhauled. Windows installed. Lettering stenciled on by spray gun. Venetian blinds installed and checked. Batteries rebuilt, resealed, and checked. Seats placed in cars ready for installation. Baggage rack hangers installed. Individual seat lights wired and installed. Exterior of the cars are painted. The welder and his torch. The riveter and his gun. The pipe fitter and his wrench. The electrician and his wire. The finisher and his screwdriver. The upholster and his peculiar technique. The painter and his airbrush. Each directed his skill to complete his particular part of the task. Then July 24th, and the men who had contributed of their skill and energies pridefully exhibited the completed train to their families and friends. As this record of remarkable construction continues to unfold, you will see the fine appointments and features of the Hoosier. The modern mail compartment, an ample baggage and express space. The coach, with individual reclining seats made of foam rubber cushions, 
hammock suspension back, molded plastic ends, the seats and backs made to conform with and support all parts of the body. The beautifully appointed combination bar lounge where friends may meet and while away the pleasant hours of travel. The rich and luxurious dining room. The interiors of the rebuilt passenger coaches were designed by the noted transportation artist Raymond Lowy. The exteriors of the passenger equipment were painted in crimson and gray, the school colors of Indiana University. The freight equipment got the black and gold of Purdue. July 25th, and the new train was run from Lafayette to Wallace Junction and back to Shakedown, and Monon men and women rode as passengers. The Monon's 100th anniversary year couldn't have come at a better time for advertising and public relations purposes. The Monon was dieselizing rapidly, and it was rebuilding the hospital cars into state-of-the-art accommodations. Berger decided it was time to celebrate. A centennial train with musicians and pretty girls on board was dispatched from Chicago in July, running southward with stops at 20 towns en route for a four-day observance at New Albany. Well, the first stop in Indiana was at Hammond. Here, as a young broadcast reporter, I covered the event with Frank Reynolds for the Hammond radio station. The Monon had borrowed the B&O Civil War era locomotive, the William Mason, to pull the vintage coaches for the celebration. Moving with the old engine and occasionally helping it along was the Monon's new RS2 diesel road switcher, pulling standard coaches because enough of the new cars were not yet ready. The songs the Monon commissioned for the centennial was called The Bell of the Monon. The lyrics talking about one young woman or another from various towns along the line. One of those bells who rode the train, adding glamour to the event, was Miss West Lafayette, now Fern Honeywell Martin. Well, of course, the most exciting thing for me was the stop in Lafayette, West Lafayette, because that was my hometown. And it was really thrilling to pull in on this little old train and see tons and seas of people there waiting to greet us. And it was fun to be introduced by Mr. Berenger and to have these people from your hometown come out to welcome you and say, hey, the Monon's having a party and we're glad we're part of it. Oh, the bell of the Monon was she, was she redhead, blonde, brunette. Was she sweet Susie Bowman from down around Yeoman for Sadie from West Lafayette? Oh, the bell of the Monon was she, was she Mrs. O Madam or Miss? When the harvest moon shone on the bell of the Monon, whose lips was she waiting to kiss? Just outside the little stop, uh, they would stop the train and all of us would get off at the streamliner and run around and hop into the little old train and we'd sit by the open windows and they would fire up the engine and we'd steam into town to the depot and there was always a tremendous gathering. It was, um, it was very exciting to see the way the people in these large and small communities turned out to welcome us. Transportation Day at New Albany saw the arrival of the Centennial Train. The William Mason here was joined by the new streamlined train of ex-hospital cars pulled by one of the line's new diesel locomotives. There was a parade, 
and it was the climax of the huge mobile party and show which an estimated 100,000 people had seen as the train made its way from Hammond to New Albany and Louisville. The Monon's connection at Louisville, the Southern, brought out its antique replica of that line's first engine, the best friend of Charleston. the most colorful events of the day was the presentation of the bells of the Monon, lovely representatives from towns along the line. moment had arrived. The new streamlined Hoosier was on hand to complete the dramatic pageantry of a century of railroad development. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine, cause that root and tootin' Monon, she's a Hoosier. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine, cause that root and tootin' Monon, she's a Hoosier. All aboard, all aboard, if by Indiana home that I'm ahead and sore. Up and down the Monon, Governor Ralph F. Gates of Indiana brought the state's official greeting to this birthplace of the Monon. August 17th of 1947, the new streamlined Tippy Canoe is christened at the Indianapolis Union Station by Mrs. Emil Schramm. Now, she was the wife of the president of the New York Stock Exchange. The same train set that evening was turned around to become the first run of the new Hoosier and with President John Berriger, John T. McCutcheon, the famed Chicago Tribune cartoonist, broke the ceremonial bottle. It was a fitting gesture. McCutcheon was not only a Hoosier, but he'd been a Purdue student. By November of 1947, enough hospital cars had been transformed into Monon coaches that a second train set was available, allowing both the Tippecanoe and the Hoosier to be equipped with new cars. The new passenger trains were indeed lovely. They rode well and looked good. They never lived up to the rejuvenated railroad's hopes for them, but for those who rode the cars, they were a delight. Now, those of us who have eaten in the dining cars can testify to the accuracy of one of the centennial songs about the wonderful Monon meals. <laughs> Let's call for dinner. Let's call for dinner. Let's call for dinner. All the soup is on the table, and the steaks are on the fire. Of this famous Monon menu, you will never. Let's call for dinner. Let's call for dinner. Let's call for dinner. We will serve you with a smile as we click off mile by mile on your favorite Hoosier line. All across this great big nation, there's the epicure sensation. All those wonderful Bum, 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 bum. 
Springs at French Lake saw the establishment of a spa, the French Lake Springs Hotel, famous for its Pluto water bath, said to be a stimulant to good health. The Grand Hotel there even had tracks right up to the front door where passengers and owners of private cars could step off the train and into the hotel. And this was at the end of the branch line, which left the main line at Orleans. Further, this was a good stopping point for those who wished to attend the Kentucky Derby at nearby Louisville. From here, the railroad ran special trains on Derby Day to Churchill Downs. Former Monon conductor Gilbert Young tells us about these movements. They'd leave Chicago Friday night, arrive in, in Louisville Saturday morning, attend the race and spend a day in Louisville, then leave Saturday night, uh, and some of the trains would go back to Chicago, and some of them, that uh, they were all, all the trains weren't operated by, uh, were not, uh, loaded by the Monon, they were usually all uh, travel agencies. They had uh, that would reserve various cars, uh, and uh, they all traveled in groups. The Monon basically just hauled them. Some of the trains always went back to Chicago after the derby race, and uh, then uh, a few of the trains always went to French Lick. Uh, early in the, my early career, was the gambling was still on for a Sunday day of gambling, and then they left later that evening, Sunday evening, for Chicago for a morning, early morning, Monday morning arrival. Uh, both the Monon's race trains and regular service movements used the K&I Bridge over the Ohio River in Louisville. The bridge owned by several railroads also was used by the other lines, including the Southern. The Monon, as with other rail lines, had to figure the passenger trains were a lost leader, that the real economic base of the railroad was its freight service. President Berger's efforts at making the Monon a super railroad went much further than just fine passenger trains. The roadbed was improved. The diesel locomotive fleet was complete by the end of 1948, so that there no longer were steam locomotives on the roster. Among the early purchases were RS2 and BL2 locomotives. As for the BL2, it was a case of beauty being in the eye of the beholder but it was a versatile locomotive, handling both freight and passenger runs as well as yard chores.
One of the unusual portions of the Lions Roadbed was the Paisley Trussell, which was a floating structure built over what appeared to be a bottomless bog near Cedar Lake. But when President Berger took over, he realized that one of his new diesels could disappear if it derailed on the trussel. So the trussel and the line around the edge of Cedar Lake was moved farther west to higher ground. Among the more serious accidents on the Monon was the June 3, 1947 head-on collision at Ash Grove, north of Lafayette. Three crewmen died and one was injured. The ICC report said the southbound train failed to obey a meet order and signals. The wreck which wiped out the passenger station at Monon September 17, 1951, killing the engineer of the thoroughbred, remains a mystery. The fireman testified that the dead engineer had refused to slow down for the curve at the Monon station, and the train rolled over, demolishing the station. Two girls waiting at the station were seriously injured, as was the 16-year-old telegraph trainee, Malon Cookie Eberhardt. When the Bud Company came out with its rail diesel cars, known thereafter as RDCs, it sent one of the self-propelled vehicles on a tour of several railroads, including the Monon. For a two-week period in April of 1950, the car made two round trips a day between Bloomington and Monon to connect with the Indianapolis-Chicago trains. It made the normal stops along the way, but the Monon didn't buy. Under President Berger, the Down at the Heels Monon had perked up and had become profitable, paying dividends from 1946 to 1957. Berger indicated that much of this was due to the fact that the railroad dieselized early, with its resulting savings. Indeed, John Berger carried a positive and far-reaching outlook for the railroad industry as a whole. In a June 1970 interview with railroad journalist Tom Shedd, Berger believed that both regulatory changes and work rule changes would allow a new era in rail fortunes. Well, I'm assuming one thing. America has immense capital resources, and once we get the railroads on a fundamentally sound basis, I don't think you're going to have any trouble getting the capital you need. And I've always thought that if we can do this, get these things in the ICC reforms, that we can handle two-thirds to three-quarters of the all the freight in the United States that moved over 50 miles. President Berger left the Monon for several other railroad management positions he was to hold in the ensuing years. He was replaced by a like-minded man, Warren Brown. But Brown was fighting the trend of the times, and eventually it was seen that the passenger service, once with four trains a day out of Chicago, had to end. The passenger service now had gone to only one train a day, and that carried an average of 63 passengers per trip. On September 29, 1967, the last Monon passenger train out of Dearborn Station was covered by the I media. I really hate to see the service done away with, not because it's me, but because it's the, for the traveling public through the state of Indiana from Illinois to Kentucky, serving the colleges of Indiana. So the, the Monon did the job, even though uh, lots of people didn't use the, use the train. Uh, I think somehow we ought to find a way to transport people by train. Thank you so very much. 40 years ago when I attended Purdue University and then Wabash College. I was constantly on the Monon going back and forth to see girls at the other end of the line always. As you <laughs> used the Monon to... I, su I supported the railroad then. <laughs> I expect to cry my beer all the way down to Louisville and back. <laughs>
next day, September 30th, the final northbound train to Chicago stopped at the Lowell Station, where the high school band met the train for a final send-off. On board the final passenger train was the Monon's last legal counselor, Frank Van Bree and his wife. As for other passengers, this was a bittersweet trip. Van Bree having to file the final train off papers with the ICC. Despite the fact that he also loved the Monon. In 1960, New York financial interests purchased control of the Monon and a Florida man, William C. Coleman, was installed as president. His regime made efforts and plans to increase the freight traffic. In 1964, Coleman revealed the Monon had purchased 20% of the common stock of the Chicago South Shore and South Bend electric line. It was planned that the Monon would use the South Shore track from Michigan City to reach the building Bethlehem Steel Plant and the new Port of Indiana at Burns Ditch on Lake Michigan. Now, this did not come about, and the Monon became a merger partner with the Louisville and Nashville Railroad in 1971. The LN operated the Hoosier trackage as the Monon division of the LN and later it was known as the Monon subdivision of the Louisville division. By 1982, the l itself had become one of the members of the family lines and thus entered the fold of the seaboard system. Then in 1986, it all became a part of the giant CSX Corporation. Why did the Monon have to lose its corporate identity and be merged into the Louisville and Nashville Railroad? The Monon's last corporate secretary and head of the law department, Frank Van Bree, touches some of the reasons. It was really a combination of reasons. The most significant, perhaps, is that we were only 325 miles long, and we originated only one-third of our own business. That meant we were a bridge carrier for about two-thirds of our traffic, just about reverse what it is for most railroads. As a result, we were constantly being short-hauled by the larger carriers with respect to revenues. And the amount of traffic that we did generate and terminate was not enough to make up the difference. The next reason was probably the failure of the Interstate Commerce Commission to approve our petition to establish coal docks on the Ohio River and at Michigan City, Indiana. We had hoped to take barge coal, put it on trains, take it up to northern Indiana where it would go to the power stations or be transferred to lake boats. When the commission decided that we couldn't do that, our traffic base was again further diminished. Another reason, perhaps somewhat less significant but worthy of note, was the Monon's failure to gain control of the South Shore, which would have established access to the Burns Harbor port and other northern Indiana business. So those three things, I think, probably explain pretty completely why the Monon had to find a merger partner. The Hoosier Line had been an institution in Indiana for generations. Chicago Tribune writer George Ade often alluded to it, including one quote where he said, the traveler who wishes to see Indiana must go riding on the Monon. Indiana is so rich. Not with gold and silver treasure wind will be gone tomorrow. Indiana's treasure store is a wealth of good old Hoosier lore. No one else can.
Rootin' Tootin' Monon passed into what Professor George Hilton has called a decent and honorable history. But for as many employees and admirers, the words of the song still express their nostalgia. She's a Hoosier line. Pennsylvania's got the pimp in Michigan, did the beer market. But there's a grander railroad yet. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine. Cause that rootin' tootin' Monon, she's a Hoosier line. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine. Cause that rootin' tootin' Monon, she's a Hoosier line. All aboard, all aboard. My Indiana home that I'm ahead in court. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine. Cause that rootin' tootin' Monon, she's a Hoosier line. As the final years of the Monon story unfolded, various redundant sections of track were abandoned. The Paoli branch to French Lake, the trackage into Indianapolis Union Station, and the section between the old Hammond Station and State Line Tower at the Chicago city limits. The last customer on the north end of the remaining trackage was the Times newspaper of Hammond. Here in the late 1980s, where the Centennial train once stopped for ceremonies, the Times was getting its newsprint by rail, only this time it was being delivered by the giant CSX Corporation. As the 1990s began, public officials in northwest Indiana were setting up efforts to use the old Monon tracks from Lowell to Cedar Lake to Hammond and Chicago for a commuter line because CSX wanted to abandon the now weed-grown right-of-way. The Monon legend in Indiana continued long after the corporate identity had ceased. Nearly two decades after the last Monon train, there still were several things which kept the legend alive. For one thing, in their book on the Monon, Stephen and Gary Dolezal gloried in the fact that at least a portion of the Monon main line still carried high-speed passenger trains. Amtrak, through Lafayette's Fifth Street and past the old limestone station made into a community theater, still ran passenger trains to and from Chicago. The bulk of the Michigan City line north of Monon was abandoned and torn up. A short stretch of the track south from the Lake Michigan shore to the Brown Bulk facility was maintained to carry three to four hundred cars a year with aggregate. The cars switched by the south shore.
Now, at Brown's, owner Leonard Brown still kept one of the Monon's business cars on his siding. He restored it and from time to time used it behind Amtrak trains. This was the car that President Warren Brown named Lynn after his granddaughter. The car originally had been built by Pullman in 1924 for the Great Northern Railway. Another of the Monon legends which continued to fascinate Hoosiers was the BL2, number 32. It was restored by the Kentucky Railway Museum at Louisville and used on various excursion trips. In 1989, it was part of the 50th anniversary of the first FT freight engine built by General Motors Electromotive Division at LaGrange, Illinois. The first FT was there, the BL2 being one of the legendary early diesels which changed the face of railroading. In order to get the BL2 back to Louisville and the rail fans there, it was put into a freight lash-up in which the second locomotive of the CSX train heading south out of Lafayette also was a former Monon locomotive. This was an unexpected bonus for members of the Monon Historical and Technical Society holding their annual meeting at Lafayette in the fall of 1989. The Monon Historical and Technical Society acquired Caboose 81532, which had been used by the LNN as a dynamometer car and later in miscellaneous service. They acquired it in the yellow LNN paint. Well, the volunteers restored it to Monon Bright Red, and it was leased to the Indiana Railway Museum at French Lick, where it has been displayed and used on fan trips. <laughs> For anyone who knew that the Monon no longer existed after 1971, it could be surprising to see a pair of locomotives moving through the Indiana countryside, all bright and fresh with crimson and gray, as late as 1989. Indeed, these are not real Monon locomotives, but former Milwaukee Road engines painted by the Indiana Transportation Museum and leased to a short line, the Central Railroad of Indianapolis, which headquartered in Kokomo. The engineer for the Monon lookalikes on one trip was T.J. Sailors. It, it's hard to believe. I, I tell you what, I really, I really enjoy it, uh, especially the old Monon engines. Uh, I don't know, it just, it's, just gives you a good feeling, you know, and, and especially the old covered wagons, which I run long, long time ago. I didn't figure I'd ever see them again, you know, ever be able to run one. Here I am running one. So I'm getting a big kick out of it. <laughs> CNO Railroad, uh, we had a diamond we crossed at what we call Wade on the other side of La Crosse. And I used to see some Monons go across there because we'd get stuck by them once in a while, or we would stick them. You know, whichever come first, you know, that's the way it worked.
So, for those who remember, the rootin' tootin' Monon continued fragrant in memory. Long after the trains no longer ran, Hoosiers would tell you how they went to college, or to the races at Indianapolis, or how they took a special to the football games. The Monon was an Indiana institution having a lasting effect on the people and the history of the Hoosier State, out of all proportion to its modest size. Watch for more exciting programs from Pentrex.